Hello, everyone. Where did James go? I was waiting for that great introduction that he did last week. <laughs> I was like, is he coming? Where is he? Did he run away? I'll introduce you. How's everybody doing tonight? Everybody have a great week? We made it. We made it another week. That's good. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, before we go ahead and open up, let's go ahead and open up in prayer and uh, come before the Lord. So, dear Holy Father, again, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to come into your house, to lift up our voice, to shout our praise to you, Lord. We pray that that form of worship would be a sweet sound in your ear. We thank you so much for the gift of life, the very breath that we take, Lord, we know is a gift from you. And we thank you so much for your long, tender mercies, your kindness, your patience, Lord. We thank you so much for what you're doing in our hearts and in our lives, Lord. I just lift up this service to you, Father, that you would be glorified. I pray that you would prepare the hearts of everyone that is here, that you would open up their spiritual ears, Father, that that what you have for tonight would be a seed that is planted and that you would give that increase. Lord, I pray that you would help me to decrease, that you may increase. I pray that you would just think through my mind, speak through my lips, Father, that as we take this journey through your land of, in Genesis, that you would help us to walk a more intimate walk with you. That as we get to see all the fears that the patriarchs had had and the worries and the concerns and the, the way that they overcame them, watching your hand, leading them and guiding them, Father, I pray that upon our lives. That as we stumble, as we fall, that your love for us would just pick us back up, dust us off, remind us how much that you love us, how many times that we fail you, how many times that we have just turned away. We ask that you'd forgive us, that you'd prepare our hearts, Father, and give us one more day just to get it right, Father. With a grateful heart, we just give you praise. In your name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. <laughs> I get my, I get my, yeah, yeah, I got my stick. Yes, so I, I, I got some feedback on this stick. And the feedback was I must use it. Because apparently I didn't do very good last week. I was all, it's up there, can't you see it? So... Just a quick little recall of what we did last week. I tried to take you guys on a land far, far away. And I had you guys close your eyes, and I wanted you to visualize this place that we were taking. How many of you guys were here last week? And you guys came back. That's awesome. Because <laughs> nobody knew that teaching maps would be so fun, right? But let's see what you guys remember. So last week, this is a test. It's a surprise test, OK? When it comes down to this bottom area, unfortunately, I left the names up there so you guys can read it. But if you didn't read it, what is that part of our map? It's the part of the cat. Good job. The way we described it last week is this is the area where the big cat's at. What sound does a cat make? It purrs. So hey, here we have the Persian Sea or the Persian Gulf. As we walked away from that, we found the two rivers that were coming off of it. And the river on the right is where the big, ferocious cat lives. And that is what? Very good. You guys were listening. On the left side of the Tigris, this is where you met the big cat and you became afraid. So this river is called the Euphrates Cat, or Euphrates. As we went further north, we went to up into this area in here where the cat gets its lives from. How many, yes, how many lives does the cat have? Nine. Nine. So this place is called 
Nineveh or Nineveh. As we moved on, we went to where the cat ate. The cat eats these big rats, right? So what is the place that is up in this area? Mount Ararat. Did this stick with you guys? Or did you go home and study it? I'm blessed either way. Okay. Then we had this place where the friendly ghost, Casper the friendly ghost lived. And he lives up in this far corner. And what's that sea called? No, the Caspian. The Caspian Sea where Casper the friendly ghost was at. Okay. And, I, and I, I'm afraid that I made an error because after I told you guys that I locked my clients in my chair for an hour, an hour and a half as I was doing their services that I get to talk to them and I told you that most of them didn't know where Babylon was. And then I failed to tell you guys where Babylon was. So in through here, coming right off of Ur, this is where Babylon is. This is where Babel was at. Okay, right above that, kind of sneaking in with Nineveh here is where Assyria is at. So now when you guys read the captivity of Israel going to Syria or into uh, Babylon, now you know where they went. With that, now we are on the other side of the map. Okay? James had a great idea last week to pull out some maps, which we did, but I got some great feedback saying, bad map, we need a new map. So we got to see some new maps. Hopefully they will help. Okay? So now we're going to be over here on the left side of the map. And really what I want to do is we came down through here into Shechem, into Bethel and Ai with Abraham. But what I want to do is get this part into our heads because this is the area that is most important. Okay, This is where you're going to see Jesus walked. There's a lot of history through this where if you guys know where this is at, it's going to help when you guys are reading your Bible because everybody reads their Bible every day, right? Amen. So when you guys are reading through this and you start finding where these are at, it'll just help us understand and hold on to God's word. I know that it's changing my life. The more that I'm reading, the more that I know where these places are at, the more that I can hold on to it and recall it much easier. So I, I was telling the kids that uh, I was going to pick on them because this is what we were learning in children's ministry is we have two colors in our C's. Okay? The top left corner of our map that I had you guys imagining. So top left is the black. And not that red is opposite of black, but it goes well with black. So down here is the Red Sea. So we have the Black Sea and the Red Sea. And through here, in this small little area, this is the Sea of Galilee. This is where Jesus calmed the storm. This is where he walked on the water. This is where he fed the disciples after his return. So in through here is the Sea of Galilee. The little string of line coming down is the Jordan River. Okay, this is where John the Baptizer was baptizing. Okay, down in the Jordan. And then down here we have the Dead Sea. Now, let's see if, how many children ministry people do we still have in here? <laughs> so in this bottom three corners, we have three bodies of water. And the way that we remembered them was how? The med, the dead, and the red. Okay, so med, dead, red. Kind of just fit in that corner. I thought it was an easy way to remember. So that is the Mediterranean Sea, the Dead Sea, and the Red Sea. What's really fun about this, as you guys start going through, I encourage you that even after tonight that you continue searching out your maps because when Paul takes off, He's going to be taken up, up over to the top of the Mediterranean and up and through this area here. So you can just continuously add to your map. Okay? That is what I wanted to open up with today. Because again, I want you guys to understand where these are at. But as far as last week, last week we had a great journey. We took Abraham uh, we went to the Garden of Eden. We went to the land of Shinar. Went up to Mount Ararat. Okay, we went through all these areas. Abraham came down into Bethel and Ai. From there, he went into Egypt, where we remember that he denied Sarah being his wife, said that it was his sister. I don't know. I tried finding out how long Abraham was in Egypt, and I don't know. But we do know that when he came out, 
he was relatively pretty rich, okay? But, can I get these lights on? These lights. Can't read my notes. That'll be good. Okay, so now he's coming out of Egypt. He's going back into Bethel. They're playing with me. <laughs> it's like, can you, read, can you read it now? Can you read it now? Okay, so he went from the Negev, journeyed back to the place where Bethel, where he first erected that first um, altar there. And again, as they came out of Egypt, this is where um, they, they came out very rich. So in saying that, thank you, okay? So going into Genesis 13, when they got to be so well off, let me go ahead and go to the next slide. So we're coming back out of Egypt. We're going back to Bethel and Ai. When, when Abraham gets over here, they start, the, the, the herdsmen of Adam and Lot start fighting. They start throwing blows. They're like, that's my piece of grass. No, that's my piece of grass. No, that's my piece of grass. And they ended up arguing so much that Abraham finally said, Lot, I tell you what. Says, look all the way around. Tell me which way you want to go. If you go left, I'll go right. If you go right, I'll go left. Okay? As we read here in Genesis 13, it says, Lot looked around and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan toward Zor was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. This is before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abraham lived in the land of Canaan, which is in through here, while Lot lived among the cities of the plains, pitched his tent near Sodom. <sighs> Pitch his tent near Sodom. The very last line, our Bibles are usually broken down into little paragraphs. The very last line of my paragraph in my Bible, it says, Now the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. Okay, so he ended up coming down into this area here. Okay, I think the next slide will give us kind of a reason of why. When I typed this in, the plains of Jordan, this is what came up. I don't know where this is located at. I just know that it came up. But now you can almost see why Lot found this to be attractive. He's got a lot of sheep. He's got a lot of cattle. He's got a lot of herds. So now this is obviously very tempting. Abraham moved his tent and went to a place called uh, by the Tabernacle Tree of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built an altar. I think my next slide here is where Mamre's at in Hebron. Okay? So here's our Dead Sea. Here is Salem, Bethel. Right below that is Mamre or Hebron. It is said that they are kind of one and the same, but in our map it's divided, so maybe two different places. But when I was doing a study on this a while back on the whole tabernacle tree, I tried to find it so I could make sure that I wasn't telling lies. So I'm going to step away from the pulpit a little bit on this one. But it was interesting that it said that he went to the, the tabernacle tree. When I was doing a study, this particular tree was a tree that during the night would suck in all the moisture out of the air and would become filled with dew, become filled with moisture. So come the morning, when the wind would start blowing, well, it kind of sounds like a swamp cooler to me. Because as the dew is sitting there dripping down, the wind's blowing through it, the cool air's coming through, and it becomes a cool breeze that he's feeling. So that's the tavern tree there in memory. Now, we're going to get into the War of the Five Kings. Let me have you go. Oh, let me see the next slide. This is Hebron. 
This is Hebron, I think, more now than it is back then, because we didn't have any photographers back then. <laughs> okay? But you'll see that it's much more busier. It's a more of a city. And what you can't see in these pictures is there's really not a lot of green. There's lot, not a lot of pastures. I mean, yes, you can live there, but nothing like the Jordan. Nothing like the Jordan. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so now that Lot has gone his direction, Abraham is up in Hebron. There was these kings that decided to kind of go on a rampage. So we have the king of Elam, king of Shinar. Where's Shinar? Do you guys remember? It's over here by Babylon, right? We have the king of Elisar, and the scriptures say it's the king of nations, which is an interesting term, king of nations. I, as I was studying that, it seems to translate goim. Two different commentators, one put goim here, one put goim here. So it was a long time ago, they don't really have pinpointed where it's at. But those are the four kings. And so in the days of Amraphel, the king of Shinar, Ariok, the king of Elisar, uh, I can't say that word, Shadalamar, king of Elam, entitled the king of Goim, went to war against Barat. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. The king of Sodom. Okay, so these kings, you saw that they are over here in the Fertile Crescent. You guys remember the Fertile Crescent, Mesopotamia? As they're coming around, they come down on this side and attack all these different places, El Paran, Kadesh Barnea, Tamar. So they went and just started annihilating these places. So then the, uh, so the next slide, this is who they went to war with. So you have Sodom, Gomorrah, Zor, Adma, and Zeboim. They met in the valley of Sidim. Okay? And they went to war. The four kings ended up coming in here and wiping out the five kings. Okay? And they took captivity of everything. So they came in here, destroyed all these cities or towns in through here, came down and destroyed all of these kingdoms and took everything as captive or took all the, the, the women, the men, the animals, everything. Okay? And then, let's see the next slide. When they took over the area, one commentator says they're on this side of the Jordan. Another commentator says that they came on this side of the Jordan. I tend to go with the one on your left, mainly because after you've created a victory and you've had the, the losses that you may have had, coming back this way to me makes sense because who is going to contend against you? You just wipe that whole area out. So if you're coming back into my neighborhood, I want nothing to do with you, right? Okay? So they took the booty of all this area, brought it all the way up to a place called Damascus. Actually, they went a little bit past Damascus. They, uh, excuse me, they went through Dan, passed up Damascus up to a place called up here called Hoba. There was a servant that got out. And he ended up coming all the way back down. I don't know where he escaped from, but let's say here in Dan area, he comes all the way down to Hebron to tell Abraham what happened. Could you imagine, you know, I was trying to visualize this when I was putting this study together. This single man comes in dirty, sweaty, possibly cut up, torn up, and he comes into Abraham and he says, Abraham, Abraham, you're not going to believe it. He said, we're over there playing basketball and like 
these four kings came in and just wiped the whole place out. And he says, and your nephew? Your nephew Lot was taken captive. They took his wife. They took his kids. They took his animals. They took everything. It's all gone. It's destroyed. So Abraham takes 318 men. Okay, so I got a, I, 318 men. When I talked to you guys earlier, I talked to you about scriptures being a treasure map. That if you look at it as a treasure map, that you find all these little morsels of, of things that you can hold on to. This is one of mine, is the 318. I get into numerology. One of the things that I love is when you're reading scriptures, three is usually the number of trinity or the triunity. Five is the number of grace. Seven is the number of completion. Eight is the number of new beginnings. So when I found this, he took 318 men. Why not 350? Why not 300? Why 318? Well, to me, if you have 318 men going against four kingdoms that just wiped out five kingdoms, you better have God on your side. So, again, with... Oh, I don't... <laughs> this number's not up there. So for 318, three to me is the triunity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The number one is the unity or the one, the number one for God. Well, eight is the number of new beginnings. And this is going to be a whole new beginning. So, Abraham went after him. He went as far as Dan, went up as far as Damascus, went up to Hobar, where they were being held, and he split the, the camp with his 318 men and wiped out the kingdoms wiped out the three kings. So now, he's coming back down and he's bringing back Lot. He's bringing back his wife, his kids, his, the whole town of, of, of Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay? Because that's where he was down in this Zor area, the Sodom and Gomorrah. All that place was taken. Last week I talked to you a little bit about when Jacob was going up to Haran that he stopped in this place where he saw a staircase. And when the morning came, he put up a pillar and he named that place Bethel. Okay? So even though he is writing it, about a time of the past, he calls it Bethel, but later he says it was a town called Luz. I say that because in my studies, the only real place that I find Dan is in the 12 tribes of Israel, 12 tribes of, of Jacob, so his kids. It was just something that caught my eye. I don't know if it means anything, but so as he's coming back down, I'm going to come on this side. If you guys can, I don't know if you guys have this on your map. I think you do. He's coming back down from Dan, and he comes down to Salem. And right here in Salem, Hebron, Salem, okay, is where he meets a man named Melchizedek. Melchizedek is the king of Salem. Okay? In verse 17 it says, The king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shiva, or the king's valley. Okay? But before he gets there, he is met by Melchizedek. Okay? So as he's coming down into Salem, the king of Sodom, I don't know how he is still kind of around, but he comes to Abraham, and at the same time, the king of Salem is where he meets Melchizedek. When he meets Melchizedek, Melchizedek brings out bread and wine. What did we just do tonight? Who else brought out bread and wine? 
He was a priest of God. Abraham even gave him tithes. Is this sounding a little bit familiar? Later in the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews talks about the perfect high priest, and it says, Having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, and was designated by God as high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Okay? So, we're going to do something fun. This is another one of my little morsels that I catch on to, and I love this. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. So here's the Valley of Shiva, which is right above Jerusalem area. It sits seemingly between Ai and, and Bethel, between Salem. Next one is Melchizedek in Salem uh, came out to meet him. And now your next one. My treasure map. I shared with you last week about the names. Okay, you remember the names of Adam and Seth and Enoch? And, well, here is another place of names. Ur. How many people now know where Ur is at? Right? So Ur means flames. So it's the place of flames. God called Abraham out of Ur and brought him into Canaan, or what God calls the Promised Land. Abraham is God's chosen. When we, he's the father of faith. When we have faith in God, we become children or chosen by God, right? We have come into the presence of Melchizedek, who is a high priest. His name means king of righteousness. He's the king of a place called Salem. Salem means peace. So he's the king of peace. Over here, they meet in the Valley of Shiva. I learned this today, and it made this even better for me. Okay? When I found out that Shiva means the plain that makes equality, what did Lucifer always want to be with God? He wanted to be his equal. He wanted to be God, right? So when I found out that they met in a place of equality, I was like, okay, this is freaking me out. Then we have the king of Sodom. Sodom means the place of burning. Bera means the evil one. When Bera, the king of Sodom, came down to meet with Abraham. It says that, now the king of Sodom said to Abraham, give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. That word for persons? Souls. You could have the whole world. Just give me your soul. Is this taking you back to a time when we had a king of peace. Our righteous king was taken up to a mountain and was told, all of this I will give you if you bow down and give me your soul. So when you're reading scriptures, as you're going through this, look for the models that are there that shows you just time and time again on how the Old Testament... I say this all the time. The Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. Okay? They are hand in hand. They work perfectly together. Okay? So, um, so do you guys see that? Do you see how that comes together? I wasn't sure if I presented that in a way that would make sense, but I hope I did. Chapter 15 talks about God telling Abraham that I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward, and reminds Abraham that through his seed he shall bring forth his descendants. He's talking about Isaac. He also tells him, let me see what the next slide is. Yes. This isn't what I needed yet, but 
He tells Abraham that he's giving him from the Nile to the Euphrates River is the land that he's giving Abraham. It's so amazing on how Israel locks up right here. And as I was reading this and I was studying this, I started thinking to myself, if, Abraham, if God gave Abraham from the Nile to the Euphrates, is there more to happen to bring that about? I don't know. It was just one of those things that got me thinking. I believe right about now, Abraham has gone back to Hebron. Okay? Going into chapter 16, this chapter is about Hagar, the Egyptian. And we remember the story so well. Sarah was barren, couldn't have kids, got this bright idea to give Hagar to Abraham. And then later becomes angry and kicks her out. Well, not true. He had Abraham kick her out. Which left me a little stunned of why it was her idea, but he had to, to, to tell her to go. I was watching this movie called The Bible. I don't know if I believe in all of how they promoted it, but one of the things that I thought was really, really good was this area where Abraham, Sarah says, take Hagar, my, my maidservant, to be your wife, to bear children for me. He agreed. But the movie portrays it that he is coming out of the tent of Hagar. And he's coming out, he grabs the side of the sheet of the door, and he opens it up and steps out. And right behind him is Hagar laying in bed with the blanket kind of covering her. What made it interesting was that the movie portrayed Sarah being an eye shot away. It's almost like she set it up to be just sitting there to see what it was going to be like when Abraham came out. How interesting that she sets herself up and she watches and when he comes out he looks at her with disdain looks at him to see whatever a woman would look for <laughs> I won't touch that one okay because the jealousy that would burn the, the envy the anger the, 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 the betrayal it's like how dare you do this right so that's 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 my, I would burn. I would burn. Somebody would die. Okay? So Hagar is now picking up on this intensity. And she's all, I got to go. This is not a good place. So she takes off to a place called Shur. Shur is about 70 to 90 miles from Hebron area. Okay? So she's coming. It's really right over here. And that's where I thought she was heading. But as I was reading the scriptures, it says that she had gotten, that the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness by the spring on the way to Shur, which changed my, my, my thinking. So then I thought, well, where is she really? Let me see the next slide. This is Shur. <laughs> She never made it there, so she never saw this picture. But go ahead and go to the next one. So, <laughs> I, I just put that in there so you guys can see. Uh, so we're up here in Hebron. She takes off. She comes in here to Beersheba and then comes down and Scripture says that this is where God found her. I believe this is the wilderness of Zin, if I remember correctly. <clears throat> When he found her there, God tells her that she's pregnant. 
and that she's about to have a baby. Well, she's going to have a baby. And God tells her, I want you to name the child Ishmael. Which means God hears. As she's sitting at this well, Scripture says that she named it, I'm going to blow this, I blow it every time, Bir Lahoroi. Did I say that right? Bir Lahoroi. Which means, you are the God who sees. Trapped in my little world of finding cool things, so you have the all-hearing God and the all-seeing God. His omnipresence, his omniscience. Okay, he knows everything, he sees everything. I thought that was really cool. But now we're going to move forward a little bit. And he was about 84 years old when he had Ishmael. Isaac doesn't come until he's 100. So he's approximately 13, 14 years old. <clears throat> Imagine, so after she leaves Belarai and goes back to Sarah, God told her to go back to Sarah. Okay, so now she's back. She's got 13 long years. This movie, Back to the Bible, shows where Abraham is out with Ishmael. For some reason, when I read it, Ishmael was kind of a second thought, kind of cast it away right away because she left. So it's kind of an outcast. But the movie portrays it that he loves this boy. And why not? It's his, his, his own son. And he's loving on him. And the movie shows where there's a target out a certain amount of ways. And he draws back a bow. And he fires it off and hits the target. And Abraham went over there. And, you know, I have a little seven year old. You guys know I, uh, Elijah. Oh, he's eight now. And I grab his little head and I'm just all like, good, good boy, good son. You did great. That was so awesome. You are the bomb. I didn't even know you could shoot that well. But Sarah is sitting on the side. My boy, my son. Look at him. He's just over there ranting and raving about this kid. Not even my son, you know. And, and she started to burn with this anger and this frustration. Can you guys feel it? I mean, I don't know if... No, I better not go there. Woo! I, mind, I better not go there. Uh, I'll take it in a personal sense, okay? When I was young, my dad and my mom got a divorce. To see my dad, I, I've longed so much for my dad to tell me that he loves me. I went 35 years, never heard my dad tell me that he loves me. <clears throat> went 47 years, never heard my dad tell me that he loves me. Finally, I kind of put him up against the rail, and I was like, Dad, I'm 47 years old. I have never heard once heard you tell me that you love me. Well, I'll just know that I do. Well, then, then, then do it. Then do it. I want to hear you say that you love me. At 47 years old, I finally heard those words, son. I love you. The, the world stopped. I mean, okay? But I say that all when I was young, 17 years old, we, they went through a divorce. The woman that he married had two kids. Ooh, they went to Disneyland. They traveled. They were, you know, he was all about them, teaching them how to drive. And I was like, mm -hmm. you know, you get that little jealousy to say, that's not your kid. I'm your kid. You didn't do that with me. Okay? So you kind of see how this is coming about. Okay. So now, the chapter's changing one more time. Okay? So, we went to where the, f nine, the five and four kings, the nine kings went to battle. Stressful. Okay? Totally stressful. Well, now we're going to come here with Hagar. Stress. Stress. Okay? Now we're going to go into Sodom and Gomorrah. Do I have the next one up? Oh! This is the Bir Lahorai. This is a well. I don't, I don't think that was the one she was at. But, and then this is overseeing, uh, entering into Bilorai. And let's see the next one, Sodom and Gomorrah. That's where we're going next. 
chapter 18, in the beginning of the chapter, we remember the story that the three men came to Abraham and they showed hospitality. Oh, we've seen his hospitality kick in. And so these three men come. He sees them. He approaches them, talks to them, goes in. Sarah, 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 quick, quick. We have guests. Get up. Make something to eat. Runs out there. Kills a heifer. Gives it to the, to the, to the, to the butcher. And he feeds these three guys. As the chapter goes on, in verse 20 it says, Because of the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very great, I will go down to see whether or not they have sinned. We know that Abraham went into negotiations with God. He said, God, are you, are you a righteous God? Are you an unrighteous God? Are, will you kill the righteous with the unrighteous? He says, if I find 50 righteous people, will you, kill, will you wipe out the, the, the city? He says, for 50 people, I will not. He goes to 45. If there's 45 people, will you destroy the city? I won't do it for 45. He continues his negotiation. How about 30? If I find 30, I see a salesman a little bit in Abraham here. How about 20? How about 10? He gets them all the way down to 10. Can you imagine negotiating with God and getting him down to 10? Now, I could be wrong on this, but my imagination takes off. And this is what runs through my head. So now Abraham has negotiated all the way down to 10. And I think he thinks he's pulling a little bit of a fast one on on God here. Because in his mind, Lot lives here. Well, I raised Lot. He's a good kid. He knows. He knows God. He sees me. He's got to be a believer. And the scripture says that you're not supposed to be unequally yoked. I'm going to guess that his wife's probably pretty safe too. Maybe not the most righteous woman, but got to be, right? And they had two kids. Look at you find people bringing your kids here to church tonight. He says, there's four. There's four of the ten. All I need to do is find six more. I'm thinking this is a pretty good deal. Some commentators believe that there was about 600 to 1,200 people in Sodom and Gomorrah at the time. I think that's probably a little low. It was a big business world. It was Sin City. I mean, could you imagine Las Vegas looking like Las Lunas? <laughs> okay? So it's a, big, it's a big place. Okay? Some commentators say up to 200,000. Another commentator says up to a half million. Well, if I got to come up with six people out of 600 or a half million, I'm thinking my odds are pretty good. Wow. With that being said, what's it to say about Sodom and Gomorrah? The exact reason for the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah I thought was pretty clear at first. Okay? When, when the, three, the two men came in to uh, meet... Oh, let me say this real quick. So the two men came down into Sodom where Lot was at and Lot opened up his door and says, come on in, man. He says, stay a while. Let, you know, you guys can spend the night. Don't go sleep out there. That's, that's, that's bad lands out there. Stay in here with me. It's much safer. He says, we'll make dinner. We'll sit down. We'll have a good conversation. He gave them a good hospitality. Abraham gave them a good hospitality. When they came over, knocking on the door, he says, those two men that are in there, send them out so we can have unnatural relationships with them for the kids. It's like a PG-13. Okay? <clears throat> and they demanded Lot to send them out. What was interesting is Lot says, don't do such a wicked thing. He says, here's my two daughters. Take them. They've never been with a man. What? I couldn't even begin to imagine that. Okay? So again, we start seeing God's hand from Abraham lying about his wife to Hagar and 
Sarah's relationship, how God just continues to have mercy on us, leading us, guiding us, bringing us to a place of repentance. That's amazing. Even in the book of Jude, it mentions about sexual immorality, unnatural lusts, and abominable things. So it's pretty easy for me to believe that this alternate lifestyle was a huge reason for God to judge the city. But then I learned something else. This stunned me because this hit my heart a little bit harder. Another thought that those that lived in Sodom lacked hospitality. When the two strangers went in, they went pounding on it and wanted to do services of violence to them. They weren't hospitable. In Ezekiel 16, it said, God compares Jerusalem to Sodom, saying, Sodom did what you and your daughters have done. He explained that the sins of Sodom was that she and her daughters are arrogant. They're overfed. They're unconcerned. And they did not help the poor and the needy. They were haughty and did, det did detestable things before me. The sin of in Ezekiel there is that they didn't have hospitality. They were fat, but they didn't give. They were selfish. They were hoarders. How many times have we gone down the street, somebody needs help? Eh, somebody else will get them. Or maybe they won't see me. I came down here uh, last Tuesday. There's a gentleman walking down right in the middle of the road. And I'm like, come on, come on, I gotta go, I gotta go, hurry, hurry, hurry. And he turns around and he sees me. I was like, oh man, I don't have time for this, I don't have time for this. So I pulled in, I'm waiting, hoping that he's gonna go away. And he turns around, he's waiting for me. I was like, all right, Lord, you got it. <laughs> I'm, I'm in this now. So I get out of the truck, and, and that's the Spirit of God comes over. He's so soft, he's so sweet, he's so forgiving. I was like, hey, man. He says, do you need help? Do you know the name of the pastor that does, does this church? I said, I do. Is he in? And he's not. He's actually in Israel at the moment. He says, man, he says, I have had the hardest time getting help. He said, nobody will help me. I go to churches, they turn me away. I go to the shelters, they turn me away. I can't find help. I don't know if he's telling me the truth. I don't know if he's lying to me. But I do know that he's pleading out, saying nobody will help. So then I thought, well, the church across the street, they're usually open. <laughs> but then I thought, how can I help? What can I do? And unfortunately, or what have you, my ministry has not been the mission fields of the streets. Okay, I, that's not who I am. But I know somebody who does, who knows Gil. Mighty man of the streets, right? That man, he's, he's fearless. He's fearless. So I called, I called up Gil. I said, hey, Gil, brother Gil, man, I need some help. I said, I got a gentleman here. Told him the guy's worries. He says, take this number down. Give the man the number. So I gave him the guy the number. I told him to go to God's warehouse. And the guy told me, man, he says, I haven't eaten. I can't remember when. He said, I don't have a phone to call anybody. He says, I, I'm, in hard, I'm in a hard place. <laughs> so the Spirit of God took out some money. I said, here, take the bus to God's warehouse. Go. Don't wait. And I see him walking up Montgomery. I don't know where he's going. Okay, so our, our time passed and I got on my way. But how many times do we reject people as the church? How many times, not, I'm going to say this, this is going to sound horrible. Don't record this part. When it comes down to me helping the homeless, it's hard for me because I can't relate. I've never been there. I don't know what it's like. It's, it's a scary world for me. I can't do it. 
But what I can do, and this is where I think the church really fails, is you, every one of us, has gone through an issue that somebody else is going through. And they need that help. But do we, do we stay in church long enough to say, hey, can I pray with you? What are you going through? Do you need some help? I was like, nice seeing you, man. I'll see you next Sunday. It was great, man. It was nice seeing you. One thing I love about this church is pastors put up the Jerry's place. We have fellowship. Okay? We have lunches. People come together. We get to talk to people. Get to hang out. I think that's huge. And I think that helps to build relationships. But even more, <clears throat> I think it helps broken hearts heal. Amen? Sorry, I went off on a tangent on that. That had nothing to do with my, with my notes here. So back to the hospitality of, or the lack thereof of Sodom. But listen to what Jesus said in Matthew. It says, If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave the house or town. Truly I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. That hit me hard. Because now it takes it away. Because it's easy to get mad at alternative lifestyle. Oh, you sinner. You but when it comes down to pointing your own finger at ourselves for the lack of hospitality, how easy is that? How easy is it to, to lend out a helping hand to someone? So here's the pictures of Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, <laughs> this is the ruins left, obviously, of Sodom and Gomorrah. This is Sodom. And you can see almost the 90 degrees. It's pretty big. You can see the land mass that it kind of sits on. Let's see Gomorrah. Here's Gomorrah. These were said to have been tiers and walls and boundaries of, of the city. When it was over and done with, the question was, is there any righteous in Sodom? When it over and done with, next one, the fire came down and Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. If you just take a minute. When I looked at this picture, it kind of took me back almost to the 9-11 attack on our Twin Towers. I wasn't there. But if anybody was in New York when those Twin Towers came down, could you imagine the rumble? Could you imagine the crash of the buildings? Could you imagine the sound of the plane hitting the buildings? The explosions? What a small scale to Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, so next slide. I'm going to try to pick this up a little bit. Um, Isaac. I want to go to Isaac. Now, I'm, I'm, missing some, I'm missing some stories because there was a time where <clears throat> Abraham was in through Hebron, uh, Hebron here, came down to Beersheba, moved up in here to Gerar, and now is back in Beersheba. Gerar is another place where Abraham had gone to and lied to King Abimelech <clears throat> saying that Sarah was his sister, not his wife. And again, God came to him, uh, Abimelech, and said, you sleep with that woman? You're a dead man. So it happened again. But I want to get to Isaac. So um, in chapter 22, God's going to test Abraham. And remember the story that Abraham was going, uh, was told to go to a land in Moriah and sacrifice Isaac on a mountain to which mountain I would tell you the Lord said the story of Abraham and Isaac's very interesting it's another model it's another example of the old and the new so here he is in Hebron he is going up 
to Mount Moriah. Scripture says that it's three days away. He's got two people with him along with him and Isaac and they're walking up this mountain, uh, walking up to this mountain. Three days. When they get there, Abraham tells the servants that are with him, me and the lad are going to go and we're going to come back. So he puts the wood on Isaac and off they go. If you've heard this, forgive the repeatingness of it, but who is Abraham to Isaac? The father. Right? Who is God to Jesus? The father. Isaac being the son, Jesus being the son. How long was the trip from Hebron or Beersheba to Moriah. Three days. So when God came and said, in three days you're going to have to sacrifice your son. Well, for the next three days, he's like, oh my gosh, what? Are, he's going to sacrifice, I, I, well, I can do what? So you can almost imagine that for three days, Isaac was dead to Abraham. Well, how long was Jesus in the grave? Three days. When they finally get to the mountain, they put the wood on Isaac, they're having to walk up a mountain. How many of you are going to carry a, your wood like this up a mountain? You're not going to be able to handle it. So where did he carry it? He carried the sacrificial wood on his back. Where did Jesus carry his sacrificial wood? On his back. <clears throat> where did Abraham go to sacrifice Isaac? Mount Moriah. Any guesses where Jesus was crucified on? Mount Moriah. Same place. Again, it's a model of the Old Testament and the New Testament coming together as one. Can I go a little long tonight? It's like you're already long. <laughs> so real quickly, so now... There's a story. Now, uh, Isaac's going to get married. Okay? He wants to get married. It's interesting because Abraham sends a servant. We don't know. It just says the servant went. In that part of the, converse, uh, the, the scripture, it doesn't tell us his name. Okay? But he went from Hebron up to... Oh, dang, blast it. To Haran. You guys remember where Haran's at, right? It's on your paper up into Haran. That walk was 410 miles. Can you imagine? When he left Abraham, Abraham was rich, so he took 10 camels and went on this journey. So it took him probably about 10 days-ish to get there. But when he got up to Haran, he prayed and he said, Lord, the woman that comes out and offers me a drink and offers to water my camel, my camels, is the one that I know is the one that you picked for my servant, my, my master Isaac. So a little girl comes out. Sir, you look thirsty. Can I get you a drink? I know you're not a sir, but... Okay. I said, can I get your camels as well? I became a camel student. A camel can drink up to 40 gallons of water in a half an hour. He's got 10. 400 gallons of water. Okay, that's not impressive. A gallon of water weighs approximately 8 pounds a gallon. The biggest pot that they had, what do you think, a gallon? gallon and a half maybe. So she walks over to the well, walks back over to the trough, walks back over to the well 400 times. 3,200 pounds of water. A car weighs 3,100 pounds. Are we getting a visual?
Back then, the marrying age was as early as 13, 14. How old you start? 13. So approximately your age, let's say going up to maybe 20. Liz, how hard is it to get her to clean her room? Is it pretty easy? Good for you. God bless you. Huh? She wants to go somewhere. Okay. But I know that my kid's eight, and I can't get him to do nothing. Go clean your room. And he'll, it's clean. No, it's not clean, son. This young lady trucked in 400 gallons of water-ish at eight pounds, 3,200 pounds. Do you know how long that might have taken her? Beyond me. Beyond me. <clears throat> okay, so that's Isaac. That's our walkthrough. When I was talking to you guys last week, I talked to you about a map of names or people. I think that's the next slide. This is the map that you guys have. I want you guys to pay special attention to this because in this, dealt with, I can't see on that one. Does anybody have an extra one? All right, you can share for now. Oh, I have the TV. So, in through this, we have Canaanites, Perizzites, Hittites. We have Jebusites, Hittites, Kenites, Edomites, Amalekites, Amorites, Girgashites, Zidonians. These are all places on the map. This is where they landed. You guys impressed? Probably not too much. Yeah? Yeah, good. I, I, I'm loving you, man. He's all about this. What you may not know is Sidon, or the Sidonians, the Hivites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Jebusites, the Philistines, and what is called Mizraim, or Egypt, all came from one man. The descendants from Ham. Okay, so Ham, Shem, and Japheth, Noah's sons. Ham is the one that walked into Noah's tent and saw his nakedness, whatever that may mean. When Noah got up the next morning, he said, I know what you did. And you're going to spend the rest of your life being a servant to your kin, to your, to your family. How funny it is that when God gave Abraham Canaan, look at your papers. Look at how many of those are just of Ham. Lot. When Sodom and Gomorrah took place, Lot was told to go to the mountains. He says, I don't want to go to the mountains. I want to go to Zor. Fine, go to Zor. So he takes off to Zor. And what was interesting is the angel says, I can't do anything until you're there. Not until you get out of the city. But now he gets down to Zor Things are bad, so he freaks out. And he says, okay, I better go to the mountains. So now he goes to the mountains. And he sees the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. The daughters, I believe, think that the whole world has just ended. There is nobody left on this world. God destroyed the whole world. What are we going to do? We don't have a husband. Which is interesting, because they were engaged before Sodom and Gomorrah. So they decide to get Lot drunk and have relationships with him. Both of them ended up pregnant. Guess who the names of those people are? The Ammonites. Well, one son was ben Amim, but they are called the Ammonites. The other one was called Moab, and they are the Moabites. Again, interesting. Are all the Moabites bad? If I'm correct, I believe that Ruth was a Moabite. Okay? So, they lived on. Okay? And Esau, another son who denied... How do I say that? Turned away God's blessing. 
gave away his first, first birth, the birthright. They are the Amalekites and the Edomites. Servants to Israel. I, I set this up because I want you guys to see now you have maps of towns. Now you have maps of people. There's one more map that I want to hit and then I'll wrap this up. Give me the next one. How many of you guys know this? <clears throat> Books of your Bible, right? But what you may not know is that the Old Testament is broken up into five different sections. You have the law, history, poetry, the major prophets, and the minor prophets. Are you still remember them, Zay? Good. What you may not know, and, and, and ah, if, it, if there's anything I can say tonight that gets you excited, this, I hope, is the selling point. Okay? Because from here, this is how we read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. And when we read it, I know in my life, I made it chronological. As soon as I came out of Joshua, went into Judges, the time of Judges took place. Then I went on to Ruth, the time of Ruth took place. Ready? Here's the surprise. The Bible timeline. Ah, let me back up one, one, one. When we get into the history, the history books from Joshua to First and Second Chronicles is pretty much almost a full timeline that everything else was written. So when it talks about that it's the history of Israel, it's literally the history of Israel. Now go to the next uh, page. <clears throat> Here is First and Second Chronicles starting from, let's say, 1000 B.C., going down to 500 B.C. But as you look at this, Kings was written in there. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Songs, uh, Songs of Solomon, uh, 1 and 2 Samuel, Joel, Jonah, Amos, Hosea, Micah. All these things were written in the time of the First and Second Chronicle writings. So when you're reading Scripture, understand it's not in the chronological order. You'll notice that in the order, in poetry is where Job is at. But Job was written here. So when we read it way over here, if you will, in our little timeline, the reason we'll find this discriminations is because it wasn't written there. It was placed there so we could understand that it's a poetry book. But literally it was written here. I think it was Leviticus and Deuteronomy was written in a month. We read it and it seems like it takes forever. But it's really only a month. Could have very well been written first. It was written in this time. It's the oldest book of the Bible. <clears throat> but it was written in the time of Genesis. Job was in the time of Genesis. So when it talks about dinosaurs, that's how you can relate it. Because dinosaurs didn't happen after the flood or shortly thereafter. Okay, so I pray... And I and I and I and I I've been praying about this all week, that God would use this to spark a fire in you guys. I know I was talking to one gentleman this evening that likes the history of the reading about history, and this was really really exciting to read and to learn. And I pray that now when you guys are reading your your Bible that you're going to stop and you're going to remember where Hebron's at, where you're going to remember where Shechem's at, Ai, Haran, Ur, all these different places. So now you can see when it says that he went from Haran to, from Hebron to Haran, you understand it's 400 miles. When they took the Babylonian captivities from Israel, taking them to Babylon, that was a 500 mile walk. From Ur to Haran was 600 miles. So I hope this brings the Old Testament to life for you guys. So let's pray.
Dear Holy Father, I thank you so much, so much, so much, Lord, for the opportunity just to come up here and just to share that what you're sharing with me, Father. I, I pray that, that it was said in a manner that is pleasing to you, that you'll be honored, that you'll be glorified, <clears throat> and more, more so, Lord, that you'd be sought out. That we would seek your face and see just how loving and kind that you truly are. So I thank you, my Lord, my Savior, my precious Jesus, for your history or your story. Thank you again for allowing us to travel through your land. In your precious name we pray. Amen and amen.